Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video I'm going to be wrapping up all the books that I read in the month of March. It's been a pretty big reading month. I ended up getting through a lot of books this month, a little bit more than usual, I would say. And in general, I feel pretty positive about most of the things that I'm reading, although I do have my first one and a half star of the year. We will get to that. So <laughs> if you are new to my end of month wrap ups, the way that these work is I'm going to start by talking about my reading stats for the month. I'm a nerd about this. I enjoy those reading stats. If you are uninterested in that, you are more than welcome to skip forward to where I start actually talking about the books that I read. Some of these books I talked about at greater length in my mid-month wrap-up and for those books I am going to direct you there if you want to hear more details I'm just going to tell you the title and the star rating and there are also some books in this video that I've talked about at great length in other videos that I've made this month so if that is the case for a book I will let you know. I will link my mid-month wrap-up up above if you missed it and you want to go and check that out and any other relevant videos in case you're interested. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into my reading stats. Pull out my trusty planner. I do some stuff digitally, but I really like having a physical planner and it is my favorite. It is specifically a bookish planner from Little Inklings Design. This is not sponsored. They're just an amazing small business run out of Canada and I have been using their planners for several years. So I just little plug there because I think they're great. Okay, reading stats. See, they even have like a nice reading stats page. In the month of March I read 38 books for a total of 13,560 pages which is an average of 437 pages per day. That is on the high end for me. My average is usually like 380 ish, like upper 300. So once I start getting into like the 400s per day, I'm reading a little bit more than normal. I want to say part of it might have been March is still often pretty dreary. And sometimes I read more in those months where it's not so nice outside. I don't know, but it, it ended up being a lot. This month I DNF'd two books, which I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. So I'll mention those, but you can go there to hear more about them. 22 of the books that I read were advanced reader copies or books sent to me for review. So a lot of them. I had one reread. Five of them were indie published or small press. I did not read any graphic novels or manga this month and two of the books that I read were works in translation which was cool. As per usual I did listen to a lot of audiobooks per month that does make up a pretty substantial portion of my reading. In March I listened to 26 audiobooks, I read four ebooks and eight physical books and taking a closer look at those audiobook statistics, 13 of them are what I term shelf, which means I had a physical copy on my TBR shelf and I got it off through audio or primarily through audio. Some of these I did as a blended read of physical and audio together. And in terms of where those audiobooks are coming, this was a big Libra FM month. 12 of the audiobooks I listened to were from Libra FM. Some of these were audio influencer copies. Every month they make a selection of audiobooks available to influencers in exchange for talking about their program. I do genuinely love them. I also buy books from them. I subscribe for a monthly credit with them and I think they're a fantastic option if you're an audiobook listener because you can select your own local indie bookstore and the profits go to support them which I think is fantastic. So I always love Libra FM. Go check them out. 12 of them were Libra FM titles. I listened to five audible books. One was from Chirp one was from my library, and seven were audio review copies from NetGalley. I've been listening to a lot of audio books on NetGalley and I kind of love it. They've really improved their platform for audio arcs. Anyway, it was not great when it first launched, but it has significantly improved. Taking a look at age demographics, this is fairly typical for me. 26 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience. 11 of them were YA and one of them was middle grade. I guess less middle grade than usual this month. I've been reading a little more with my kids, but I think part of it is the book I'm reading to them right now is taking us longer to get through. So maybe, maybe you'll hear about that one in April. In terms of publication date, this month the earliest published book I read was from 2003 and in total I read 15 books that were published prior to 2023. So these are my backlist titles. So I didn't read a lot of really older books this time. It was more front list but you know still a decent number of semi-older backlist I guess. <laughs> 
seven of the books that I read were published in 2023 and 16 of them were 2024 releases. Partly because I am always reviewing so many books because I say yes to too many things. I try. I try. Um, Next is author demographics. I value actively working to diversify the authors that I'm reading from. And so every month my goal is to read about 50% from Black, Indigenous, or Person of Color authors, and at least 25% from openly queer authors. And this month that went very well. 50% of the books that I read were by Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color authors, and 42% were by authors who are openly members of the LGBT plus community. So pleased with how that's going. Next, let's take a look at genre. It was a big romance month for me, and I was not upset about it. I read a lot of romance, a lot of fantasy, and you'll you'll see where we are. This month, my most read genre was romance. I read 11 romance books. That includes five contemporary romances, four historical, and two speculative. Speculative is going to be your sci-fi, fantasy, or paranormal romance. I also read 10 fantasy books, six horror. I've been reading more and more horror and more and more of my favorite books have been horror. It's becoming a favorite genre for me, which has been so interesting over the last few years. Four of the books that I read were memoirs, three were science fiction, two were contemporary fiction, one was general nonfiction, and one was a mystery. So I had quite a bit of nonfiction this month as well. Then we'll take a look at star ratings. And as you'll see, this trends quite high. I was liking the majority of the things I was picking up, which I think is great. I did not give any books one star. I have yet to give out a one star this year. I mean, we're only in month three, but so far I haven't given any books one star, but I did have my first one and a half star of the year. So I gave one book one and a half stars. However, I did not give any books two or two and a half stars. Five books got three stars. Three books got three and a half stars. Ten books got four stars. Eight books got four and a half stars. Nine books got five stars and two books got six stars. And in my personal rating scale, a six star read is a favorite of the year. And I had two of them. So pretty solid reading month. My average rating for the month was a 4.2, which is pretty high. So I've honestly been having a pretty great reading year so far. I do not usually drink coffee in the afternoon, but today warranted it. <laughs> I had an early morning and a late night. It's very good coffee. Okay, last thing is I want to take a look at the progress on my reading challenges. Every year I like to set some challenges for myself of books I want to get to throughout the year. I did actually make some good progress on this, but my technical numbers won't show it and you'll see what I mean. I have read three out of the five books on my nonfiction TBR. I've read one out of the five books on my classics TBR. And while I have only completed one of the 10 series on my series TBR, I have actually made some progress in a couple of those series. So I, I've read a few books off of this, even though still only one series is fully completed. So feeling pretty good about that as well. All right, those are my reading stats. With that said, let's go ahead and move on to talking about all the books that I read this month. I will start with my DNFs and then we'll go from lowest rated to highest rated. And again, I will let you know where you can find more information about some of these books if I've talked about them in other videos. This month I DNF'd two books and I talked about both of them in my mid-month wrap up. So you're gonna, I'm gonna direct you there if you wanna hear more. Those books are The Poisons We Drink by Bethany Baptiste and The Perfect Guy Doesn't Exist by Sophie Gonzalez. Is. Go check out my mid-month wrap-up if you want to hear my reasons for that. Then we're going to talk about my first one and a half star read of the year. And honestly, I did not anticipate this. <laughs> okay, so there is a very well-known and I, I would say esteemed science fiction author who I've never read from before. And I saw in Nike Alley that they had a review copy of an anthology he's coming out with that is a mix of essays and short stories. And I thought, hey, what a great way for me to try out his writing and see if it's for me. And I will tell you that if this is indicative of his writing style, I do not think it is for me. Um, but I do know a lot of people, but I I can see how, okay, well, let me tell you who it is and then I'll, we'll talk more about it. So this is A View from the Stars by Si Xin Liu. And he is a, like I said, pretty well known Chinese science fiction author. He's the author of The Three Body Problem, which is currently being adapted for television. I've heard some good things about the show. So reading this, it is very clear to me that he is primarily an ideas writer. He is not at all a character driven writer. <laughs> okay, so this collection is a mix of short stories, 
and essays. So I'm going to talk about those as two separate things. You could talk about the fact that I don't think they really all fit together well. There's no, you know, thread through the anthology that I think makes it hang together as a collection. But that aside, let's talk about the short stories first, and then I'll talk about the essays. Clearly, I was not a fan. And in terms of the short stories, they were mostly very boring very boring. The characters generally felt more like caricatures that were just there because you needed to have a character, not because they were actually interesting or well drawn enough themselves. I think from reading this, he is just more interested in ideas, philosophical concepts, sci fi concepts. And I think writing characters is just a thing he feels like he has to do in order to deliver the ideas. I found that to be very dull. There was one short story, I think it was the last story in the collection, that I found to be a little bit more interesting and engaging. I'm still not sure I liked it exactly, but it kept my interest. It, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Based on this writing, I think that his fiction might not be for me because it is so ideas focused and very dry, in my opinion. And I just I want more in terms of characters and plot. I found them to be boring. If his novels are different, let me know. But that was my experience with the short stories. Wasn't really a fan. Then we had the essays. And the essays were kind of worse. He has a lot of ideas in the essays, most of which I don't agree with <laughs> about science fiction and related things. He's also incredibly condescending about fantasy. And it's very clear from the way he talks about it that he has not actually read most contemporary fantasy himself. He speaks of it as if fantasy is all either sword and sorcery or Harry Potter. <laughs> he also kind of shits on character-driven science fiction. Listen, it comes across as very condescending and elitist and I disagree with him on a lot of stuff and I did not like the essays. So why is this one and a half stars and not a one star? Because I didn't hate the entire collection and a one star is reserved for things where I'm like, I hated this so much and hated everything about it. So I don't feel like I was quite there. I rounded up to two on Goodreads to be generous, but this was not my cup of tea. And so based on this, I am not feeling interested in picking up his novels. Am I wrong? Do you think based on my experience that I would like his novels? Are they better? Let me know in the comments down below. But I was not a fan of this collection. So that was my first one and a half star of the year. Moving right along, let's talk about my three star reads. This month, there were four of them and two of them I talked about in my mid month wrap up. Those books are The Atlas Complex by Olivia Blake and Thirst by Marina Yuskuk. If you want to hear more about either of those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I actually have five three stars. Sorry about that. So there, there's three others we're going to talk about. Uh, I also gave three stars to Anna K. Away by Jenny Lee. This one I liked but didn't love. I think I liked the first Anna K. a lot better. It was a contemporary YA retelling of Anna Karenina that felt very kind of gossip girl adjacent. I really liked it. I don't know that I necessarily needed a sequel to it. I see what she was doing here in terms of exploring grief and sort of the fallout of what happened in that book. I think it's done reasonably well. I probably found it less interesting because everyone's going their separate ways. And so instead of having everyone in the same city, we have people in three different places. It was it wasn't bad. I, I still enjoyed it. But it was a three star reading. Like it was good. Didn't totally blow me away. But you know, it was fun. I think if you really liked Anna Kay, you might pick it up. It's it's good. And I think it does a good job with the topics that it's trying to tackle. I don't have strong feelings about it. I also gave three stars to I felt the end before it came by Daniel Allen Cox. This was very interesting. It's a memoir, but it's in the form of essays. And I did not realize until the acknowledgements at the end of the audiobook I was listening to. I had this from Libra FM for a review. Um, I did not realize until the end of the book that it had been a collection of essays rather than a continuous memoir. And that does explain a lot of things. So a lot of these essays had been previously 
published in other places. And I do think because of that, it was sort of to the, its detriment as a memoir. It was very scattered and all over the place and sometimes jarring in terms of the tonal shifts that you got later on. So while I thought that parts of this were really interesting, it is a memoir of a queer man who grew up in Jehovah's Witness and is no longer a part of that. So some of the essays that were specifically about his experience growing up and leaving Jehovah's Witness and coming of age were really interesting and then it takes kind of a jarring hard turn into geographic de descriptions of his experiences as like a 20-something living in New York City and being an artist and a sex worker and a porn star and it was just such a tonal shift and I feel like thematically things were all over the place. I don't know. I, there were parts of this that I liked a lot. I don't know that it hangs together super great as a memoir, but I'm always a sucker for these books about people leaving high control religious groups and that was part of what drew me to it. I think later on in this video we're going to talk about a book that does it far better, but it was still reasonably good. I'm not mad that I read it three stars. I also gave three stars to The Inheritance by Robin Hobb and Megan Lindholm. This was such an interesting experience. So you might be familiar with Robin Hobb. She's become a bit of a booktube darling in fantasy spaces. I love her fantasy books. I'm doing a read-along right now of The Rainwild Chronicles of, by her. I think she's an incredible author. Now what you might not know is that she also writes under the name Megan Lindholm and I had never read anything that she wrote under that name until this collection. So this is a short story and novella collection that is half stories by Megan Lindholm and half stories written by Robin Hobb. And it's funny because she says in the introduction that most people have a strong preference of whether they prefer her writing as Robin Hobb or Megan Lindholm, even though some people like both. And I am one of those people. I have a very strong preference for her writing as Robin Hobb. I mean, her writing as Megan Lindholm is, is interesting. It's just very different and more contemporary sci-fi and fantasy. There was a story that I really liked a lot in that part of the collection, but most of them I felt very middle of the road about. The second half is things set in the Six Duchies, the world of the realm of the Elderlings, and I really loved those. I think it was especially interesting reading this before starting the Rainwild Chronicles, because one of the stories in here basically documents how the, the traitors in the Rainwilds originally came to be. And I didn't realize that's what the story was until I started reading the Rainwild Chronicles, but it's fascinating. So uh, three stars because it was a little bit of a mixed experience, but I'm happy that I read it. And it was fascinating to see how different her styles are for the two different author names. Moving on, let's talk about my three and a half star reads. This month there were three of them and two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are The Black Girl Survives in This One, edited by Desiree Evans and Cericia Fennell, and Check and Mate by Allie Hazelwood. This you can also find me talking about at greater length in my latest Read It or Unhaul video. Those are always really fun where I start with 12 books, read the first part of them, decide which ones I want to continue with. And so this is one that was included there. I'll let you know which other books uh, were, were in that, but I'll link that up above if you're interested. I also gave three and a half stars to The Dating Dare by JC Lee. This was another audio influencer copy from Libra FM. It's a contemporary romance following two characters who decide to have sort of a no strings attached dating thing after they meet at a wedding. They're both in the wedding party. She works at a brewery with her family. He is about to go off to Paris to pursue fashion photography and they end up falling in love. I liked this. I think it's fun and light and frothy, a pretty good rom-com. I think my main complaint was they have so much physical chemistry, but I wanted to see a little bit more of their emotional chemistry. I'm not sure by the end of the story, I really bought that they were in love with each other as much as they liked each other. So I wanted a little more from the romance, but I enjoyed it. I think her writing is pretty good. I think it's fun. And if you're looking for something light and entertaining, this is a good pick. Next is my four star reads. There were a whole bunch of them. This month, there were 10 four star reads. Five of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are 
But Everyone Feels This Way by Paige Lail, Moon Rising by Twee T. Sutherland, Night of Cake and Puppets by Lainey Taylor, Where Sleeping Girls Lie by Farida Abike Iamide, and finally, I Feed Her to the Beast and the Beast is Me by Jameson Shea. This one was also part of that Reader on Hall challenge if you want to check it out. If you want to hear more about any of those books, go check out my mid-month wrap-up or go check out that Reader on Hall video. I also gave four stars to A Viscount for an Egyptian Princess by Habba Helmi. This is a Harlequin historical romance that I had for review from NetGalley and I really liked it. Now if you're a romance reader you probably know that there is a long history of of white authors writing these like shake romances or these like Middle Eastern princess ro romances that are like weirdly fetishizing and exoticizing and so I was excited when I saw this come up because it is a historical romance set in Egypt by an Egyptian author. She is Egyptian and Muslim and the heroine is also Muslim and that is a significant part of her character in the story and this is also drawing on a lot of the real history of Egypt. I thought it was really cool. It follows two characters who accidentally meet at a art exhibit in Paris and then when the guy is going down to Cairo to visit a royal friend that he had from university, he finds out that the woman that his friend is supposed to be betrothed to is none other than the same woman he hasn't been able to stop thinking about. And it's kind of a slow burn romance that's really good. I will say the early part of the book is a bit slow and at times a little bit dry, but it gets really good and by the end I was rooting for the couple. Really enjoyed this, four stars, definitely would recommend if that sounds up your alley. I also gave four stars to Blood Justice by Terry J. Benton Walker. This is the sequel to Blood Deaths, which I really liked. I was a fan of it. I like that they've updated the covers. I think they give more the vibe of the books than the original, even though it was a beautiful cover. I don't think people realize that this is contemporary fantasy. It's set in New Orleans. It's very messy. It's giving CW show drama vibes. It's got a full cast of characters who are morally gray. One of the main perspective characters is a gay teen boy, and the author is also gay, so I like the queer representation in this. It's also dealing with issues of racism and justice and revenge and family trauma and there's a lot going on in here. I thought this was going to be a duology but it's definitely not. It leaves us on a little bit of a cliffhanger ending so I'm very curious to see where this series is going to continue to go. I hope it starts picking up more readers. I think it's really fun if you like morally gray characters, if you like kind of high melodrama CW teen show type vibes, this is the series for you. I also gave four stars to Every Time You Hear That Song by Jenna Voris. I had this for review from Penguin Teen, so thank you to them for sending me a copy. I really liked this and I wasn't sure because the premise sounded cool but I can also be a little bit of a hard sell on a road trip story, but this does it in a way that really worked for me and was a lot of fun. It's a dual timeline narrative, so part of it is set in contemporary times, part of it is set in the 1960s, and it's a queer coming of age story with a light mystery slash scavenger hunt element. So it follows this woman who I feel like is modeled a little bit on Dolly Parton's kind of the vibe she's giving, who is a famous country singer who's recently passed away and she left behind the scavenger hunt of clues to unreleased music and a cash prize. And so we have a heroine in the modern day who is a big fan of hers and a burgeoning journalist who decides to go with a co-worker on a road trip to try to find the clues to the scavenger hunt and you know find information. But then we also get flashbacks to the 1960s as she is a young woman starting off her career trying to make it big as an entertainer and sometimes harming relationships that she has because she's seeking fame to the exclusion of other things. Yeah I really liked this. I think a lot of people will enjoy it. It's really heartfelt and I gave it four stars. This is out now. I think it came out April 2nd. I also gave four stars to The Color of Law a Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America by Richard Rothstein. This was on my nonfiction TBR for the year and it's really good. It's definitely worth reading. It recounts the history not only of redlining but of other practices as well where the law was used to unofficially segregate communities to make it more challenging for black families to build generational wealth including with things like terms on home loans. The, the information in this is 
wild and it is well worth a read. Highly recommend for anyone. I feel like this kind of stuff should be taught more in history. It is pretty staggering some of the details of things that have gone on. So would recommend. I gave it four stars. I think the beginning of it sometimes feels a little bit repetitive. I get it because I think he's trying to drive home how many places and how often this was happening and it gets more interesting in future chapters where it's not like that but the first chapter can get a little repetitive but still a really good book and uh would recommend. My final four star read of the month is Throne of Glass by Sarah J Mass. This was my one reread of the month and I did a very in-depth spoiler vlog and recap of this going chapter by chapter talking about connections to the wider universe of books and pulling out easter eggs. I will link that video up above if you haven't seen it and you want to check it out. That was really fun. We also did a live show for this book talking about how does it hold up for us as a reread. I think a lot of us downgraded our ratings at least slightly. So we talked about some of the problems with the book but also some of the things that really work with it. So if you're interested those are available. I'm enjoying the project so far. It was a fun reread and it was four stars. Moving right along, let's talk about my four and a half star reads. This month there were eight of them and four of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Monstrilio by Gerardo Simano Cordova. This was also the book that I vlogged for patrons and channel members this month, so y'all have that. The Great Change and Other Lies by Joe Abercrombie. Thunder Song by Sasha Lapointe. And When the Earl Met His Match by Stacey Reed. If you want to hear more about any of those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave four and a half stars to At First Spite by Olivia Dade. I love Olivia Dade's books and I had a feeling I was going to love this one as well. Finally picked it up. I really enjoy her contemporary rom-coms with great fat representation and this one was no different. Although I will say that while this one is funny and lighthearted a lot of the time. It is a little bit more serious than her other books because it deals pretty graphically with mental health issues including depression and anxiety and we see our heroine go through a major depressive episode and I loved how that was handled. I thought it was really beautifully done. I was not sure <laughs> with the setup for this how I was gonna feel about it because the whole deal is that our heroine two weeks before the wedding is broken up with by her fiance. Meanwhile, she has already left her job and sunk all of her savings into buying as a wedding gift this spite house next door to him. Except as it turns out, his older brother, who was part of what broke them up, lives on the other side. <laughs> and she is ready to go out of her way to make his life miserable but then they end up falling for each other and I loved this. I loved how it came together. I liked their character arcs and how it dealt with each of their individual history of trauma and how it dealt with the ex-fiance and um, I don't know it was really good. The other thing about this even though there's no specific diagnosis is I suspect the heroine is probably also neurodivergent in some way not just that she deals with depression but neural spicy in other ways and I liked the way that that was depicted so definitely would recommend. It's a little intense at times but it's also very funny like there's a part where to get on his nerves she starts she starts like blasting monster romance audiobooks out her window. It's, just, it's very funny but also serious. So four and a half stars, really good. I also gave four and a half stars to Haythor and the Prince by J.J. McAvoy. This is the third book in the historical romance series that she's been writing, which is great for fans of Bridgerton. And I think this is her best one yet. I loved the romance. The pacing is really good. I know that she came from originally writing contemporary romance and I feel like with book three she's really hitting her stride. I liked the other two books. They keep progressively getting better and this one so far is my favorite. Each book follows a sister in this family that's in a pseudo regency era but it's like a made-up version of the regency era where there wasn't all the racism. So think Bridgerton's but with Regency vibes centering black characters. So if that's something you're looking for I think that her series is really great for that. This one was hilarious. It's an enemies to lovers romance where the two people do not like each other but uh, uh you know end up falling for each other. It was, it was really good. I more people should pick up this series. They're fantastic. I also gave four and a half stars to Sex, Lies, and Sensibility by Nikki Payne. This as if you couldn't tell is a contemporary retelling of Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility with 
with a black heroine and an indigenous hero, and I really liked it. I think you can tell that she is very familiar with the source material and plays with it in smart ways that have a lot of Easter eggs for people who know and love Sense and Sensibility, but it's also something that I think anybody could read. I don't think it's a perfect book. I think there are some things that I maybe wanted differently, but I also think it's hard to give the reader everything they might want from this kind of an adaptation as a modern romance without just being a really long book. But yeah, there was a lot of drama. It's also got some very steamy scenes and I was a fan of it. I now am excited to read Pride and Protest, which is her Pride and Prejudice retelling, and I'm curious to see what else we get from her. I also got to meet her at a book event, which was really neat, and she was amazing. So this was very good. If you like a Jane Austen retelling, I know they can be hit or miss, but I would give this a try. My final four and a half star read this month was Shaina Lene by Darcy Little Badger. They do say at some point in the text how to pronounce this. It is the Lipan Apache word for sunflower, and it's also the name of the main character who goes by Shane. This is so good. It is a prequel novel to Elatsoe. So if you've read Elatsoe and you loved it, this follows Ellie's grandmother in the 1970s as a young woman in this kind of slightly fantasy version of our reality as she is trying to track down missing kids and her mom who went missing through magical means and figure out what's happening. So it's a bit of a slow burn novel. It's not super fast paced. It takes its time. It's really interested in building out the characters and the world and giving you context and background. And it's not hurried, which I think a lot of times when people are reading a mystery, they expect a snappier pace. But I think if you can just go with the flow of this, it's really great. It's a fantasy mystery with an indigenous heroine. She goes to the underworld as part of this quest. Very, very good. Four and a half stars. I think if you loved Alatsue, you should definitely pick this one up as well. And I had a review copy from NetGalley. All right, moving on. Let's talk about my five star reads. This month there were 10 of them, which is amazing. And five of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are on the Way to the Wedding by Julia Quinn, Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, The Good House by Tananariv Du. I feel like this, in hindsight, this is probably like a four and a half, more than a five, but we're, we're gonna we're gonna stick it here. Some more I've thought about it. Part of it is that this was our Patreon and channel member book club pick for the month, and I think after the discussion, I feel like four and a half is really where I feel about it, but it's still really good. I love her writing. And the Narrow Road Between Desires by Patrick Rothfuss. If you want to hear more about any of those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave five stars to Dragon Keeper by Robin Hobb. <sighs> Y'all, I, I mean, we've talked about her already. I love Robin Hobb. I don't know why this is a less beloved series of hers, maybe because it's so character-driven. I love the character-driven stuff love this. I'm going to save most of my thoughts for the live show, I have a live show Friday night on my channel to discuss this, but five stars. <laughs> I'm such a fan. I love the new characters that we're being introduced to. I love being back in the rainwilds and with the dragons and I, I'm just, I'm enthralled and she also breaks my heart. It's, it's great. Really good. I also gave five stars to Late Bloomer by Maisie Eddings. Really loved this. It is a contemporary sapphic romance that is super low stakes and cozy. So if you like a romance that doesn't have a lot of conflict or most of the conflict that there is is somewhat external rather than internal to the relationship, this was fantastic. And it also features two neurodiverse heroines. One of them is autistic, one of them has ADHD and may also be on the spectrum, although she hasn't been diagnosed. And it is just delightful. It's so good. So one of our heroines wins the lottery, but a smaller version of the lottery. And because she's very impulsive, decides to buy a flower farm off Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> which is a great idea, um, but she buys a flower farm off of Facebook Marketplace with her winnings, planning to go and make art there. But when she arrives, there is a young woman there claiming to already live there and be the owner and refusing to leave. 
turns out she's the granddaughter of the former owner who passed away and they end up making a deal where they will both live there for a year and you know work something out but of course they end up falling for each other. I, I love this. It's somewhat of an opposites attract romance. It's very sweet and cozy. It also has steamier scenes that I think are pretty good. I was really a fan of this. I did get a question on Goodreads so I'll just address this here for anybody who's who's wondering. Is somebody said that they were wondering if it was an age gap romance because they thought the cover looked like a mom and daughter kiss which I'm like that's interesting. I didn't take it that way um but no <laughs> that is not the case. I think there's maybe three or four years between the two of them so if that's a concern you have don't worry about it. I really liked it a lot. It was great. Five stars. I also gave five stars to Record of a Spaceborn Few by Becky Chambers. I loved this. I liked book two in this series, but didn't love it as much as book one, Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. But Record of a Spaceborn Few just really hit. These are companion novels, so they follow different characters and do different things. This one is just, it's so good. It's, she writes cozier, character-driven science fiction that also has interesting ideas, but also the idea of what things could be like if things were better than they are. And this one is following a series of characters who live and have lived maybe for generations, some of them, on a spaceship. And it's about their lives and their community, the way they live communally, and some of the minor conflicts that arise. So, like there is some plot and some conflict, but I, it's really beautiful. I loved it. Five stars. Mm, she's definitely one of my favorite authors. She's amazing. I also gave five stars to Unholy Terrors by Lyndall Clipstone. And this is another one of the books that I read for that reader Unhaul Challenge. I'm going to say this is not going to be everybody's cup of tea, but I really, really enjoyed it. It is a strong flavor. It's like a YA dark paranormal romance, I guess you could say. It's sort of like if you like the vibes of the Locked Tomb series, like Gideon the Ninth, etc. from Tamsin Muir, but if you want it as more of like a blood-drenched sort of dark romance with morally gray characters and maybe a little bit of vampire lore and gods and weird religious stuff, I think it's really good. It is heavy on the vibes. Lots of vibes. Like, I... I can understand why this is not going to work for everyone. I ended up kind of loving the melodrama of it and I think it has a really satisfying conclusion. I was worried when I got close to the end that we were going to get another book, that it was going to be a cliffhanger ending, but it wasn't. It works really well as a standalone, it's very satisfying, and I think the world is super interesting. So there is magic, blood magic, bone magic. It's on the darker and gorier side. It feels like it's got some horror mixed in there, but I, I quite liked it. So five stars for me. My final five star read of the month was The Angel of Indian Lake by Stephen Graham Jones. This was sent to me for review from Saga Press, so thank you to them. And this is the concluding volume to this trilogy. I think this trilogy is fantastic. This is a really good closing volume. This happens four years after the events of Don't Fear the Reaper. So we've got Jade in Proof Rock, Idaho, now working as a history teacher at the local high school. So we've come full circle. I love her as a character. And we are primarily in her head for most of this book, which I actually liked. Don't Fear the Reaper, we did a lot more head hopping amongst different characters, and I really enjoyed being mostly back in her perspective. This whole series is a love letter to slashers in a lot of ways, but centers a young indigenous woman, and she's su she's such a good character. I don't, I don't want to give anything away, but yeah, this was great. Really good. I think it very much stuck the landing for the series. I am left with some questions that aren't totally answered, but I feel like that's on purpose. So five stars. Lastly, I gave two books this month six stars. And in my personal rating scale, a six star read is a favorite of the year. I had two of those. And one of them was kind of a surprise. I thought I would like this, but I did not expect to love it in the way that I did. And that is Crooked Kingdom by Lee Bardugo. Yes, I finally read Crooked Kingdom. I was so behind. I've read Six of Crows twice, and I like Six of Crows. It's a heist story, which is not my favorite, so the plot for me was like fine, but I love the world and the characters. I'd been putting off Crooked Kingdom 
because I thought it was going to be more like that. And it's not. This is everything that I love. It is heavily characters. There's not really a heist. I mean, there are some shenanigans that kind of come together in an interesting way by the end of the story, but it's not structured in the same way as Six of Crows. It's got a lot more politics, a lot more character development and world building. And oh my god, it's so good. I just think the way that she does the character work in this is masterful. Masterful. It's like, why did I put off reading this for so long? It's so good. I just, I love these characters so much more and it makes me even sadder that we are not getting a third season of Shadow and Bone, even though I think the first two seasons are fantastic on Netflix. What great character work. And the fact that she just casually makes these characters queer and disabled and dealing with complex trauma, but in a way that doesn't feel forced or like token representation. It feels like a part of who they are. <sighs> like, amazing. One of the best things I've read. <sighs> of course, my camera overheated. It couldn't handle all of my gushing about Crooked Kingdom, I guess. But um, yeah, this was so good. <laughs> so good. I really, really loved it. I'm so pleased that I was able to read it. I loved it as much as I did. Amazing. Yeah. So six stars. Finally, I had one other book that got six stars for me. This was also part of that reader unhaul video that I did. And <sighs> y'all, this book it's so good. It made me cry. Like you need to be in a good place to read this book but I cannot recommend it highly enough. That is How to Say Babylon by Sophia Sinclair. This is a memoir of the author growing up in Jamaica under a strict Rastafarian household that was very oppressive and patriarchal and abusive and kind of her experiences growing up and eventually breaking free of some of that and finding her voice and her own sense of identity. And it's, it's rough. I'll be honest. It is really, really difficult to read at times, but the writing is so raw and so beautifully crafted. She was a poet first. You can definitely feel that in the lyricism of the prose and the way that she writes. It also feels like the experience of reading a novel because it's so close. It feels so immediate emotionally. And that does make it more difficult to read at times with some of these very intense graphic scenes of abuse. I have the utmost respect for her for going back and writing some of that because it must have been incredibly difficult to live through those memories again. Whew. Man, I did not, before reading this, know that Rastafarianism was a religion exactly. I didn't really know anything about it. And so I learned a lot. And she does a great job of weaving the history of the religion into her own family history. And it's complicated and it's challenging. This has been comped to educated and born a crime. I would say it also reminds me in some ways thematically of I'm glad my mom died. So if you liked any of those, I really would recommend it. Born a crime I kind of get, but that one is like funnier. It's also sad. It also made me cry, actually. I'll be honest. Like that was also very sad, but I cannot say enough good things about this and the writing is just gorgeous. I can totally see why this was a celebrity book club pick. I think it would be great for that. There's a lot to discuss. Um, yeah, if you're looking for a memoir to read, definitely would suggest this one. One of my favorite things I've read this year, I suspect this is going to be high on my list of favorites by the end of the year. It's my suspicion. Whew. Okay, so those are all of the books that I read in the month of March. Overall, I think it was a really strong reading month, and I am excited to see what April holds. I feel like I often end up reading less in April. It can be a really busy month. We've got multiple family birthdays. There's a lot happening. Kids have spring break. So we'll see how the month goes, but I'm pleased with how this went. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, okay, I have a good one. Tell me about a book that you put off reading and then when you finally read it, you were kicking yourself for taking so long to read it. This is how I feel about Crooked Kingdom. I have put it off for years and it was so good. Why did I wait so long? Do you have a book that you experienced that with? Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.